Uh, welcome, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi, I'm Joel Martin. I'm the president of Wagner College, and it's a real honor to have a chance to welcome you back to Wagner. Uh, it's sort of a homecoming for us tonight in many ways. Uh, we have a distinguished guest, thanks to the Founding Fathers Lecture Series, and I get the honor of thanking all the people who make this possible. First, I'll start with our guest parents who are here with us tonight. Thank you for being here. I understand uh, we have a colleague who used to teach our children's theater program here. That Our guest mother actually is a faculty member here at Wagner College, so that's really terrific. So welcome. And we want to thank our donors who have made this possible. We really believe in vigorous, diverse perspectives being brought to bear on this campus so that our students can stretch their minds in many different directions, sometimes be made to feel uncomfortable, and grow. That's what we do here. We grow together. Uh, we have great solidarity here. Uh, we have a wonderful community. And we also challenge each other in important uh, and warm and respectful ways. This is sort of a signature part of who we are. And the Founding Fathers is certainly a key part of making sure that happens every year. It's the third year, and I want to thank the donors, uh, particularly George Megerly, uh, Eve Megerly, Mike Nicholas, Norman Schaefer, Joan Nicholas, Aletta Diamond, who's here, Fred Williamson, who's here, Fred Lane, David Petrot Petrovis, and Lois Kaufman, and there are others, but th let's thank them for their gift. It would pay you to get to know each of these people. They're really rare, special people with distinctive contributions in many different fields. Uh, there are veterans among them. There are trustees among them. And I've really come to really treasure getting to know each of these people. Uh, we're very fortunate to have such people supporting Widener College. We're also fortunate to have a distinguished committee make this selection. And that committee comprises Alex Fox, George Megerly, Eve Megerly, Joan Nicholas, John Esser, Professor Esser is here in the back, and Gerard Kasser. So I want to thank that committee for providing us with a wonderful speaker who is indeed a Wagner alum and a native Staten Islander now living in Manhattan. To introduce her properly, I want to bring forward a professor who she didn't have the pleasure of studying with. Uh, that would be, but she knows, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Krauss, our provost. Welcome, Jeffrey. <laughs> Thank you, President Martin. Uh, this is the third Founding Fathers Lecture. We started two years ago with uh, Randy Barnett, a law professor, George Mason. Last year, you might remember, we had Arthur Laffer. And this year, this is very special because it's one of our own. AJ, of course, <laughs> on TV these days, known as Jedediah Bila, who uh, graduated class of 2000, went on to get a master's degree at Columbia, went into education, where he, you taught at just about every level, but you can teach it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Did it all. And then went into television. You know, started with Fox many years ago, went over to ABC, was on the 20th anniversary season of The View, the historic 20th anniversary season, and then went back to, uh, to Fox, where you could see her on Saturday and Sunday morning although frankly for me, it's sometimes it's a little too early, uh, on Fox and Friends, the weekend edition. And uh, she also picked up a new job last November, perhaps the most important job you can have. She's a mom now. So, so welcome back to Wagner. Thank you, Thank you so for much. being here. Thank you so much. Uh, can everyone hear me? I, I, I don't usually hold these, so I hope you guys can hear me in the back. I see my Fox and Friends, Fox and Friends up there representing. How you doing? <laughs> There's a mic for you. Yeah. Oh, do you want me to? Do you want me to be mic? Take your time. You can come mic me whenever you want. It's not going to disrupt yeah. me. It's totally fine. Um, so hello to everyone. Uh, this is a conversation with me. I want it to feel like a conversation. I don't. I, I don't really do lectures, so to speak. Um, it is Super Tuesday, by the way, so I'm not talking about the election directly in terms of uh, state results that are, that are coming in and whatnot, but I do have my husband keyed in to Super Tuesday, and we have a Q&A at the end, and if you want to ask me something about that, you can feel free to do that. Um, it's, it's really up to you what you want to ask, but we are going to comment on that a little bit because it is interesting to people and we are missing it right now. Um, sure. 
are, he, he, what's his name, Randall? Randall, Randall is here from Fox and Friends, um, to my me. <laughs> to get a little snippet of what I'm talking about today. So I'm going to do this myself, Randall, even though I usually don't know how to do this myself. I'll just clip it on. And if you can hear me, that's great. And if you can't, just come adjust it, and it's cool with me. So, okay, so I went to Wagner. I can't believe the last time that I was actually at this school was 20, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, and I was giving a valedictory speech, not in this room, and I remember the day the day was very much like the day that you see right now in terms of the weather. It was brutal weather, which drove me crazy because anyone who's familiar with this school knows that they do these gorgeous valedictory, um, uh, not valedictory, but uh, graduation ceremonies on the Great Lawn outside. And they're beautiful. You can invite as many people as you want. I had been to so many of them, and we got rained in. So we were in the gym, and there were like two guests max. And I remember my grandparents being mad, like, we can't go, and everybody was standing in the back. but. That was the last time uh, that I was at the campus officially to speak. And I'm gonna get back to a line in that speech, actually, because I went back and, and, and dug it up um, for, for a reason I'll talk about after. But I often come to the campus, and I, I kind of put my hood on, and I don't really come as me. I come kind of in a nondescript kind of way, and I walk around uh, in the winter time sometimes, and it's because I really loved this place. I had the best four years of my life on this campus. I'm not, I mean, I have a, a child now and I have a husband and those are amazing years. I don't, I don't wanna you know, say anything bad about that, obviously, but I had four years of growth and discovering who I was. I wouldn't be the person that I was today to be his amazing wife, hopefully, and a wonderful mom if I hadn't been through this school and been through those times. And I figured out who I was, right? You always remember the time in your life, whether it was high school or college or wherever, wherever you were, that you figured out the person that you kind of wanted to be and how you felt about things and where you stood on issues. That was this place for me. Um, so it always feels like coming home. I met two of my best friends here who are still two of my three best friends. Um, and I had great teachers, some of whom are here. One who was my, Katika, I'm gonna call you out for a second, but Katika was my, my mentor. Uh, she was my advisor. She taught me Spanish literature. I did a Spanish literature major here. And I know there are some people in this room, because I know you, who will hate my politics, but who also inspired me really to think and to think for myself uh, and to be able to sit right in this room right now in front of all of you and do what I'm about to do and to get up every Saturday and Sunday at the crack of dawn and do what I do. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, and you know, I was thinking about, I wrote a non-political book. It was called Hashtag Do Not Disturb. I wrote it last year and it was about tech overload in our lives and people being obsessed with their cell phones and, and all that that's doing to kind of destroy us. And I thought about talking about that, but it is the Founding Fathers lecture series. And I decided instead to get political. Controversial people are like, yes, <laughs> controversial. <laughs> um, I decided to do that because it is Super Tuesday and it is, you know, we talk about the Founding Fathers a lot and um, I work in television news. And I know that some of the topics we talk about in television news are the catchy stuff, right? We talk about the impeachment trial and we talk about, um, you know, President Trump's whatever crazy thing he said that day on Twitter. Um, we talk about these jabs that politicians go back and forth with at these debates, which have started. I don't know if any of you have been watching the debates, watching the town halls. I just watched the Fox News town hall with Bloomberg the other night where he managed to look a little bit alive for a change. I don't know if anybody caught that one, but. Um, and I could have talked about all that too, but I decided instead what I want to do is I want to talk about some of the values that I think are being lost right now. When I look at a Bernie Sanders, for example, and I, don't, I, I may have some Bernie Sanders supporters in this room, um, just hear me out. But when I look at the values that he espouses um, and, and what, he, what he plans to do when he's on the debate stage and he talks about health care, he talks about whatever issue he may, I mean, this is a guy who very proudly will endorse socialized medicine, who has been caught on video now, you know, praising the likes of Fidel Castro, who you know, is, is not exactly the nicest person historically that we could call to mind. You have to wonder, to his credit, this man is very popular. He has a very large supporter base. He's managed to get a lot of people excited. He's managed to, to, to kind of galvanize a crowd in ways that the likes of Joe Biden is unable to do. And I keep sitting here and thinking to myself, why is that? 
what has happened in our country that the message that he's putting out there has become really powerful and that makes young people in particular who are typically very rebellious of anyone telling them what to do, be it their parents or a big powerful government, why are they drawn to him? So I want to talk about some of these values. I'm going to zero in on two because I think these are the two that have caused us, the loss of these values have caused us to get into some trouble country-wise, financial trouble. Um, we're amassing massive and massive and massive amounts of debt that no one really seems to be concerned about, be they Republican or Democrat. Um, I think we're in some cultural trouble. I think we're in some character trouble. And this is not about Republican or Democrat for me. I'm not registered with a party. Everyone who knows me knows that I am an equal opportunity uh, person when it comes to picking on what people are doing wrong. Um, I am a libertarian conservative. That's where I stand on issues for the most part. But for me, politicians disappoint you on both sides of the aisle pretty frequently. So I feel pretty comfortable attacking both sides if I need to step in and, and say that someone's doing something that's not serving us well. And I do. But we have lost our way, I think. And I think the first area where we've lost our way is the area of personal responsibility. That is a theme that hits home for me, and it ties very, very closely for me with, with the concept of limited government. It's something I wrote about in my book when it came to technology, and I started to say to myself, hold on a second, why are people staring at their phones 24 hours a day and not taking the initiative to say, this is negatively affecting my relationship, this is negatively affecting my health, my sanity, because we've forgotten that we are in control of our own lives. We have forgotten that it's up to us to create the lives, the relationships, the communities that we want for ourselves. Now, the, the, the personal responsibility theme hit home for me the hardest and initially the strongest with Bloomberg. I don't know if you know anything about, you know, Na we used to call him Nanny Bloomberg in New York. Any New Yorkers remember that title that he used to have? People used to call him Nanny Bloomberg because he was in the business of government telling you what to do all the time. He wanted to ban those, remember the, the 16 ounce sodas that he decided he didn't like? He didn't want you to have those 16 ounce sodas and he didn't want you to have a certain amount of salt intake and he didn't want you to have trans fats. Now, for context for that, I am probably the healthiest person you're ever gonna meet. I get up at three o'clock in the morning and I juice celery <laughs> before my Fox and Friends show. That is the honest truth. I care deeply about nutrition. I care deeply about organic foods and poultry. I spend more time in the health food store probably than anyone ever should for their own mental health. But there's something that bothered me about the instinct to ban. Why, why did I need Bloomberg to tell me to put down a 16 ounce soda? And if I wanted to drink a 16 ounce soda, who was Bloomberg to tell me not to drink it? So it bothered me, it got under my skin. But what I saw was too many people being okay with that. Too many people were okay with Bloomberg saying, hey, you're all a bunch of toddlers, I'm government, you're not supposed to do that. And it was this sense that we suddenly needed a government to step in, and we're okay with a government stepping in, telling us what we should and shouldn't do for our own health. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because it escalated. It escalated, and it went from day one. Yeah, go right ahead. It went from day one, us being comfortable with a ban on certain soft drinks or certain salt intake, and that turned into a conversation about healthcare. And suddenly it became, well, yesterday it was about salt and soft drinks, and now it's about socialized medicine. And now it's about a government coming in and dictating to you maybe what procedures you should have, or maybe what doctors you should have, or maybe what healthcare plan you should have. And because people were so used to being okay with this concept of government intervention. And what is government? Let's just, let's just bring that up for a second because I often find when I say government, people think of it as a deity, like it's anointed in some way, like it's coming for the, for the greater good government. For the, government's just a bunch of people, right? Just a bunch of people in buildings making decisions for you, okay? So what I started thinking was why are people comfortable with this? Why are they comfortable with bans? And why are they comfortable delegating their own health, their own well-being, their own bodies to essentially another person who's sitting in Washington, D.C. In a, in a building deciding what may or may not work for your health or your personal well-being. Okay, So that, that's, where, that's where it kind of, it starts small and then all of a sudden you see a debate stage full of people who have normalized government intervention in your health and well-being on a, very, on a pretty large significant scale. 
Now, and I ask people, I could get into, I could get into details about why government-run healthcare is bad, and I'm going to give you some of those stats if you're a stat person and you, and, you, and you crave that, and some do. But on a very basic level, I find myself saying, why are you okay with that premise? Why are you, if you're an independent-minded citizen who feels that they can and should take care of themselves, why would you trust someone you don't know to decide what's best for your, for your life, for your family's life, for your child's life, for your aunt's life, for your partner's life, whatever, whatever your life looks like? But if you want stats, let's talk some stats. I want to bring some up because I think it's important because often what gets talked about is healthcare for everyone. And I always say, what about quality of care, though? Because it's not just about everyone having access to care. It's about the kind of care that you get. So Forbes had a great column out in 2018 by someone I know, Sally Pipes, and it was on the UK and what's going on in the UK. And I just want to read a little segment of that for you. And I'm not big on reading notes, but I think this is important. This is about the National Health Service over in the UK. And it says, in May, and this is, remember, for, 20, for last year, 4.3 million people in the UK were on waiting lists for surgery, a 10-year high. Adjusting for population, that would be like having everyone in the state of Florida on waiting lists. Roughly 3,500 British patients have been on hospital waiting lists for more than a year. More than one in five British cancer patients wait longer than two months to begin treatment after receiving a referral from a general practitioner. In Scotland, fewer than 80% of patients receive needed diagnostic tests. We're talking about endoscopies, MRIs, CTs, scans within three months, three months. An analysis that covered just half of England's hospitals found that almost 30,000 patients died in the past year while waiting for treatment. And finally, in some cases, the NHS has refused to provide treatment at all. In June, NHS England said it would discontinue coverage of 17 procedures, including things like tonsillectomies, knee surgeries. So when you hear stats like that, I don't see anyone that would be leaping out of their chair to run over and say, you know what, I'm going to the UK, I'm going to get my health care there. No, you wouldn't. This sounds terrible. It sounds terrible. And it often does manifest terribly. But the problem is, is that we do need health care reform in this country. So what people jump to is, we need health care reform. No one's coming up with a plan. Let's delegate it to somebody else. Maybe what they're doing is correct. Let's delegate it to government. They seem like they have more of a charitable you know, generosity of spirit. Maybe they'll get it right. But the problem is once you go in that direction, you can't go back. Think of an institution that you know of that the government runs efficiently. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> really. Um, you want something to run well, everyone knows it needs competition. It needs competition. People need competition. Right? Think about a, a, a college kid running a, running a track race. I used to run um, high school track. I need a competition. The person next to me is trying to run ahead. Oh, you're not going to win this race. I'm going to run faster. I'm going to run better. I'm going to run stronger. I'm going to train better. I'm going to. That's what drives people. Government doesn't drive people. Nowhere. Look at the stats. This is just a sample. I could have come in with six pages of this, but we'd all be exhausted and, and asleep, so I didn't do that. Instead, I want to have a conversation with you guys and give you a chance to ask me questions. And please challenge me at the end of this. I love that. Um, and education is another area that this bled into. I, Education is personal for me. I've taught in schools. Um, I loved my educational experience, but I don't know if you remember the conflict between Bill de Blasio and Success Academy right here in New York, that charter school, where you had parents low, of low income uh, situations and, and minority parents stepping up and saying, hey, I want to be able to send my kid to the school I want, and there's this academy out in Queens, Success Academy, that's turning over great rates of, of success for children in reading and math, and Bill de Blasio was supposed to provide additional funding for that and decided he wasn't going to do that. Why? Well, because he's allied heavily with teachers' unions and they did not want that money taken out of the public school system and brought into those charter schools. But guess what? Those charter schools were helping those kids. More stats for those who love stats. At Success Academy Rosedale, 99% of students passed their math exams and 96 passed English. At their Far Rockaway location, 94% passed math and 84% passed, 84 passed English. Those parents had that personal responsibility chip, and they wanted to determine the life that their kids were going to have, and they felt that education was key to that. But that is the enemy of big government. That is the enemy, because they want to be able to tell you, I know better for you. No, I know better for your kids' education. This is the district. This is where you're going to go to school. Those parents were in an uprising. They were saying no. And a lot of them were, people, were, were, were parents who had often voted Democrat, 
And they were saying, not when it comes to my kids. Guess what? It all affects your kids. Healthcare affects your kids. Education affects your kids. Taxes affects your kids. This is all about the future generations. So the reason that this is happening is something that I coined in my book, not related to politics, but related to technology, which is called a creeping normality. And that is that something starts really, really small, and you don't notice it, and it's little by little inches in, and then all of a sudden one day, bam, everything is different. And you're not even phased because it's just been seeping in so gradually that all of a sudden it's like, oh, let's just take over the whole universe government. Oh, okay, well, hasn't that been happening? You're unfazed because it's the creeping normality of what's been happening minute to minute to minute to minute. That's what's happening right now. And we're not alert to it. We're not asking tough questions. We're not saying, well, hold on a second. It's my health. It's my kid's school. You're not, you're not having those citizen journalists going out and doing their work and doing their investigative stuff to challenge what's happening by and large. Remember, um, with respect to health care, when President Obama came out and he said, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your plan, you can keep it. Well, guess what? You couldn't. You couldn't. You oftentimes didn't keep your plan, you didn't keep your doctor. Why was that important, though? It was important because it was step one of government intervention. Step two is socialized medicine. You need step one to get to step two. But if people take the bite of the cheeseburger at step one, then by the time they get to, to, to the end, they've eaten the whole thing, and they're like, wow, I'm completely full. I feel nauseated, but oh, it's over. It's done with. There's nothing I can do. You need to be reacting. We need to be reacting at step one. Okay, so the fact that you couldn't like your plan and couldn't like, you couldn't keep, keep your plan and couldn't keep your doctor should have made you angry, and it did for many people, but not angry enough. Because now we're here and we've got Bernie Sanders, which for most people is, is pretty uh, extreme, shall we say. Now, young people I want to focus on for a second. I see some students in here. Um, young people should be crazed with this stuff. You are our rebellious generation. Young people are supposed to say, I don't want my parents telling me what to do. I don't want my teachers telling me what to do. And I don't want my government telling me what to do. But for some reason, Bernie Sanders has enormous support among young people. Why? Why? Why aren't you saying, I don't want this. If I don't want to have health insurance, I have to pay a fine? What? As a 20-year-old who may not need health insurance? Insanity. This is still America, last I checked. Young people should be outraged. But they're not. So why not? Part of the reason they're not outraged is because free stuff sounds good. It sounds really good. And unicorns and rainbows and Bernie's going to give you a pot of gold at the end of every day that ends in a Y. Everybody's going to get one until it runs out. It's going to be one of those pots of gold that never runs out of gold, too. And that sounds good if you're in college and you've got student debt and you're like, well, I want free health care and I want... Problem is nothing is free and somebody pays for that. And someday, at some point, it's going to be you. The other reason that young people are becoming complacent with this is because they go to school. And what happens in school a lot of times is that you hear one side. Not every school. That wasn't my experience in school, but it is the experience of too many kids in school. You hear one side. You hear the government is good. You hear the government is generous. You hear that government is compassionate. That's often a lie. It's not how it works. You hear that high taxes is compassionate. Why? Legalized theft? Taking from one person to give to another? That doesn't help that person get on their feet. That doesn't help that person start a business. That doesn't help that person feed their family or get that sense of achievement. So young people hear a lot of that. They hear a lot of one-sided stuff. And they, and they, and they don't, because they're, they're kind of forming, I remember being in college and trying to figure out who I was, they don't necessarily react the way that they should. But we need to react. We need you to ask the tough questions, because you're the, you're the future of this country, more than any of us. Which leads me to my second value, which I'm going to talk about, which is very controversial to talk about on college campuses, which is why I do it, which is diversity of thought on college campuses. So what's going on on these college campuses, where these students oftentimes feel like they can't express themselves if they, if they hold a view that's different from the teachers, where they often feel like they have their grades suffer as a result where they often go into classrooms and they take political science and they feel like, wow, I'm walking out of here and it's like, you know, Bernie Sanders has been anointed by, by, by Jesus. It happens all the time. We see it all the time. We interview people every single week that have this happen to them. I did not have this experience. I went to St. Joseph Hill Academy, which is not far from here. Um, I don't know if you guys know it. I had great teachers. 
I had teachers who made, made me, forced me to think for myself. They were hard. Those classes were harder than my Columbia grad school classes. I say that with, without question. But those classes existed for me to think, for me to figure out where I stood on issues, for me to challenge the professor sometimes and ask tough questions and for them to challenge me. It was not about walking into a classroom and parroting what that teacher said. And they would have hated that if I did that because it would have shown I couldn't think at all. I went to um, Wagner College right here, and I did not take politics classes at Wagner. I was on a very literary journey. I took a lot of Spanish literature. I took a lot of psychology. But I had to think. I thought about relationships. We talked about things of, related to race and gender and religion. And you had to form your opinion, and it was OK to have an opinion. That was what you were here for. You're here to be challenged. You're here to discuss. Well, guess what? That is not happening in a lot of colleges around the country. You can't even have a speaker like me, and I'm not really that controversial. You know my commentary, people who know me. You can't even have somebody like me go to a college campus now without getting protested outside, without getting you know, rioting going on, violence, have to have security. It's craziness. It's madness. You have kids in college sitting in rooms playing with Play-Doh because they need a safe space while somebody like me is talking. That's crazy. 19 and 20 year olds are adults. Now, I had an experience when I left. And in fact, by the way, just to throw this in, um, in my valedictory speech, I actually talked about this and about Wagner. And I said, in fact, this is a quote from my valedictory speech that I went back and found. I said, I looked back at my, um, I said, a passion for learning and succeeding and an inspiration to think, regardless of what viewpoint we espouse, have been instilled in us by this college that has been our home away from home for the past four years. So it stuck with me from this school uh, as well, in addition to my high school. But when I went and I, I went out into the world and I taught, I taught in a private school on the Upper East Side, that was not the case. They were running a social justice campaign from that school. Inside the, 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 the classrooms was heavily political. Inside of our assembly halls was heavily political. Students were ostracized. If they disagreed, you could wear one logo t-shirt supporting this politician, but if you wore another one, guess what? You were, get, you were getting told no logo t-shirts could be worn. I remember a kid getting told they couldn't wear a logo t-shirt, and I was like, I had to jump in and say, well, what about all those that said hope and change? Those were OK. These weren't. It's a problem. It's a big problem. And I saw it every single day. I saw it when I started in TV, and I was still working there. I was teaching Spanish. I saw that I was treated differently. I saw it every day. On some college campuses, you have bias. OK, so, and this is a bit of a controversial stat. I'm going to give it to you first. But on campuses, I say liberals generally outnumber conservatives. This is true. Michael Roth, president of Wesleyan, has been quoted as saying, in New England, where my own university is located, liberal professors outnumber their conservative colleagues by 28 to 1. It's a big number. I don't think it's that high in a lot of places. But I, I don't think anybody would argue that, oh, no, in colleges, most professors are conservative. No, they're not. But that shouldn't mean that that should dictate how you teach. I really don't care what your political persuasion is. Every person is entitled to their own political persuasion. Every single person is entitled to vote the way they want, and every single person is allowed to believe what they want. But if you're sending your kids to a school, you should be able to expect them to be able to figure out who they are and express their opinion without being condemned or without feeling like they're going to be condemned, or that school's doing something wrong. The notion of safe spaces irks me, I could go insane, or the notion of kids being able to say, well, I'm triggered. It's destroying kids. It's destroying the future leaders of the country. The fact that you can create a safe space for someone at a college or university, is, do you realize how insane that is? This is where you go to have those debates. This is where you go to learn how to, how to face the real world. When you get out into the real world, they're not going to say, oh, you know what? There's a controversial speaker. There's a room over here with some Play-Doh. I mean, that is, does anyone work in a place where there's a Play-Doh room? She, people are laughing, but this is happening on campus. Does anybody work in a place where you go in and you go into a meeting and somebody disagrees with you and you're allowed to say, oh, you know what, I, this, I feel uncomfortable because I'm triggered. I'm just going to, your boss would be like, get back in here. What are you triggered by what? We're too sensitive. And it's starting here, right? Not at this school, but on these college campuses. I don't, truthfully don't know what the political, you teach political science, Dr. Krauss. I know that. Yep. Hopefully, you allow for, for diversity of thought, and I'm sure that you do. But we need more teachers like that. 
There's an example of this that I saw at Harvard that we covered on our show that actually got me thinking about this in, in an even deeper way. I don't know if you heard about the story of, um, this is last year as well, right before I went on maternity leave, there were campus-affiliated protesters at Harvard University that were protesting ICE. And um, the school newspaper, the Harvard Crimson, had decided to cover it. They said, we're going to cover it. We're going to cover, we're going to interview the protesters, and we're going to get a statement from ICE. Well, there was outrage. Why? Because the school newspaper got a statement from ICE. So the students felt triggered by that and said, you've created an unsafe space for us on this campus because you got a statement from ICE. The paper retaliated and said, this is standard journalistic practice. We got a statement from the protesters and we got a statement from ICE. But this is where we're at now. This is scary. This is where we're at, that students feel entitled to say, I'm outraged, I'm triggered, you've made me unsafe because you've asked for a statement from an opposing viewpoint from the position of a school newspaper. Okay, so this is dangerous turf we're in now. Now, of course, a lot of journalists came out in this case. This was very widely publicized. I'm sure people heard about it. Journalists on both sides of the aisle came out and said, oh, this is crazy because it was, it was so far gone. But this is what I'm talking about. This is the creeping normality. Before you can blink, this will be normalized if you don't do anything about it. And then you'll have school newspapers saying, well, I can't cover that. They'll shut us down. Okay, so it's scary stuff. This is starting to get, for, for people who care about freedom and liberty, and the Constitution and any free and, 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 and positive, respectful exchange of ideas, these things are at risk. There's a new documentary out called No Safe Spaces that is interesting. It's about um, academic freedom. And there's a quote from that that National Review Online, which is a conservative publication, covered it. And this is the quote. Among the many examples in the film is that of a Canadian student, Lindsay Shepard, who was charged with a violation of university policy merely for having shown a video where Professor Jordan Peterson explained why he doesn't accede to the new ideas about gender neutral pronouns. Watkins writes, when Shepard asked how she violated the policy, she was told that she harmed transgender students by encouraging discussion and remaining neutral on the issue. In their view, Shepard should have prefaced the video by stating that Peterson's ideas were wrong and unethical. So I don't care where you stand on transgender pronouns. That's up to you. I personally don't, I, I don't, I'm the type of person that's like live and let live. Do whatever you want to do with your own life. It's none of my business. I really don't care. I'm a libertarian. But what I do care about is that someone would be silenced from talking about it because somehow that threatens someone by having a discussion. That's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Unless you are endangering someone's physical safety, which of course should be off limits, that's what a college, a college should protect your physical safety. A college should not make you comfortable. You shouldn't feel comfortable. You should feel uncomfortable sometimes because you have to think. You should feel uncomfortable mentally, like, oh, wait a minute, I hadn't thought about that. That kind of, that kind of freaked me out. Well, maybe, wait, hold on a second, maybe I agree. Oh, maybe I don't. That's what the whole point of the whole thing is. Like I always say, good comedy should make you uncomfortable too, because sometimes you gotta laugh at stuff, and it shouldn't be that everybody's gotta walk on eggshells all the time, 24 hours a day. That's where we're at. Everybody, I have comedian friends who are afraid to go to work, because they say, if I offend somebody in the 16th row because I talked about something, somebody had on gray shoes that day, and now people who wear gray shoes are offended, that's the world, that's what it's coming to. And that's the generation that's growing up thinking that that's normal. Some of us grew up where, you know, we know the difference. We know, we grew up at a, at a more same time. This is craziness that's going on. So, and I wanna, I was originally gonna do this as a full Q&A, so I wanna, I wanna get to that, because that's where most of the good issues you know, come up, but I, I just wanna say, with personal responsibility, with academic freedom, with liberty, with these things under attack, it's a dangerous place to be. And, and you can't sit back and just watch a debate stage and say, well, this all sounds like good and harmless. It's not harmless. Government overtake of your health care is not harmless. Look at the educational system. When I asked in this room what area of life government runs efficiently, every I didn't get I didn't I mean you can feel free to tell me and I will listen because even the military has issues. People say the military. Well, no, there's a lot of overstuff for bureaucracy in the military that needs to be cleaned up too. <clears throat> So the good news is that I want to close with before I open this up because I want this to be a conversation is you have the power to fix it. Bernie Sanders, unicorns and rainbows aren't going to fix it. 
You know, not, government's not gonna fix it. We're gonna fix it. You're gonna decide the kind of teacher you wanna be. You're gonna decide the kind of parent you wanna be. You're gonna decide the kind of mom and dad, the kind of student you wanna be. You're gonna decide who you wanna vote for and you're gonna, you're gonna have the choice. Either you're gonna pay attention and you're gonna say this is my life, these are my kids, these are my parents, this is my education, and you'd be surprised. These people will not get elected if you get out and vote and you say, I'm not doing this. But you have to think about it. You really have to think about it and not accept what has become the new normal, because the new normal is gonna to be tough, it's gonna to be scary. So I wanna hear from you, but first I wanna get, do you have any Super Tuesday results by any chance? I didn't know. Oh, okay. Does anyone have any Super Tuesday? I saw that uh, Joe Biden just didn't give you. Biden won Virginia. Virginia, which is no surprise, right? He won North Carolina. North Carolina, okay. So we got the establishment coming in for Biden hard and heavy. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that too, just to give before we shift over to Q&A. Um, my one Super Tuesday comment would be that Biden's going to roll in with some pretty big support because you have a lot of establishment Democrats. You had Buttigieg. You had uh, many who have probably been, been promised heavy campaign slot, uh, uh, cabinet positions going to come in and be heavily supportive of Joe Biden. So you're not going to, you're, you're, don't be surprised, in other words. Oh, I just hear Oh, do you guys have questions for me? I would love to hear from you. Uh, anything? Yes. Oh, I knew it. <laughs> oh, well, first of all, I have a comment on um, your general presentation, and I certainly do agree with some of your libertarian views when it comes to individual liberties, mm -hmm. without question. Um, but I would like to uh, make a comment on the socialized medicine and I know plenty of people in the UK and in the Nordic countries who wouldn't want to come to America for medical care. Because after all, let's think about it, you have people, I'm sure, in this room who have their own private with big pharma and insurance companies running the government. They have to be in network. They have to wait until the doctors within their network approve. I'm sure some people have been refused procedures due to insurance. And um, I think to counterbalance that presentation of the UK statistics, you should really also include statistics from the United States and how many people who are dying annually from not being able to afford their medicine for diabetes or kidney disease. Yep. We have a huge proportion of people uh, neglected health-wise in this country as well. And that's all, of course, having to do with private enterprise that you promote so well. Yep. Uh, but I do have a question. Can I respond to that? And my question is, Could yes. you want me to respond? So my response to that would be, yes, there, there are, I do not in any way deny, I just had a baby and I, I was astounded by the, the hospital bills that I got when I came out. It, I was astounded by, I thought to myself, right now in this moment in time I have the money to pay for this, but I didn't always and it would have been a huge problem. So the fact that this country needs healthcare reform, I've become a huge uh, proponent of that. Uh, for many reasons, for women's care. They treat, you know, having a baby like you're supposed to go into the hospital, come out, and it's like nothing happened. No, women need, need care, which, which a lot of other countries do a lot better than we do. But I would take it back to the question of the approach. This is still America, and America is not the UK. And America was founded on certain principles of self-reliance and of individual liberty that should inhibit people from wanting government to be the answer, to be the solution. So even though I agree, we have a lot of problems here that need to be addressed and there, we, there needs to be a leader that comes in and steps up and do it and does it. I think that that approach should be in line with who we are and what we are and who we are and what we are to me, based on those founding principles, are people who want to be in control of their health and well-being and not have government be the solution. I would like to see the free market step in in a way. Free market's not in charge of our healthcare right now. I mean, it's just not. The insurance companies are in charge of our healthcare right now. So what I would like to see is free market reform, competition across state lines, things of that nature to lower costs for people. But I want it to be in line with the, with the founding principles that built this country because I think there is a big distinction between the UK and the US in terms of who we are and how we were founded. All right, so here's my question in yes. relation to what you just said. Um, we have the coronavirus now, yeah. well, it's become a problem. And let's take a simple example of a mother who has been told by her work, uh, if you have a cough, if you're sneezing, we're getting this advice now, stay home, don't come to work, correct? Now what if you're a mother, you're a 
obviously in a position where you don't have to worry about this. Well, what if you're a mother who has two children, who is living from paycheck to paycheck, who wouldn't be able to pay her rent or her mortgage if she has one, um, and has to go to work because she's living from paycheck to paycheck. Do you not think that it would be, again, keeping in mind the founding fathers, the common good, and the welfare of the people, and life, liberty, and happiness, do you not think it would behoove government to step in and try to help somebody like that to in her situation? Yeah, right. So, so this is this is this is a this is a good conversation to have and a good point to make because my argument is not for no government intervention. My argument is that government intervention has gotten out of control. So I'm not arguing that there are going to be people who are in legitimate need of government assistance. There are going to be people who are living paycheck to paycheck, who, who don't make enough money to, to support their families. I mean, I've been, people look at me on TV now and they say, oh, you know, she's on TV, she's making good money. I remember being $60,000 in debt and waiting table. I, I, I get it. I understand that it, it's, I didn't have health insurance. I couldn't afford health insurance at one point. So I do feel that there is a role for government to play in terms of assisting people who legitimately need that assistance. But I do not feel that socialized medicine as a concept for everyone or this idea of, of government-run health insurance for everyone or government mandates for everyone as a society at large is the solution. I don't. I think there has to be a pocket for that, and I absolutely think there is a role that government can play in that. But I don't think that as a country that it makes sense or that it will work. And the truth is, we can't pay for it. Because not one person who's come up with that plan, I mean, if you ask Bernie Sanders, or you ask Elizabeth Warren, this stuff sounds really good, but not one of them can articulate how you're gonna pay for it. Because you can tax the rich, and you can tax them all you want, you can tax the 1%, it's still not gonna pay for it. You know, Obamacare was paid for because of the mandate. That's how it was paid for, because you mandated that healthy people get insurance, and those healthy people wound up paying and funding the system. Well, guess what? Once again, this is still America, and people don't want to be told what to do. They don't want a mandate, because that 19-year-old kid is also important. Because guess what? A 20-year-old who is out there on his own, trying to make it, working jobs, who doesn't come from family money, who can't afford to say, well, you know what? I don't want health, I don't want health insurance, and otherwise, if, I, if I, I have to pay a fine and I can't pay the fine, he's also important in society, or she, or whoever it may be. So you have to come up with something that works for this country and who we are and what we value. And I would like to think that people still value their freedom. Um, I think that's why there was so much objection to the mandate, because people were like, don't, what do you mean? I don't, I don't, don't tell me what to do. There is still that little bit in there in all of us that says that. But I do agree there has to be, I think you can do both. You're sounding like a left-wing libertarian, not a conservative. <laughs> Will we lower the heat? <laughs> yes. Hot in here. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Should you do that? No, no, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good evening. I'm going to bring up the founding fathers. When the founding fathers found our country, you could not vote. And that's the very beginning of the Constitution. Secondly, a lot of people in this land of America were only counted as a portion of a real person. So there's something wrong there. And then another thing which I'd like to hear from you is you want government to stand, stay away from telling us what to do or not to do. Yeah. And yet government is forcing a major portion of Americans, women, to controlling their bodies one way or another. How do you stand on that one? Okay, so the first two points that you made, I think, are good points about what I like to call the concept of perfection, right? When this country was founded, it was a very different place. You look at this country 20 years ago. We did a segment on, on the sitcom Friends. I don't know if any of you watched that show. It's one of my favorite shows where a lot of the actors were saying, if this show was launched in 2020, we wouldn't be able to say half these things because these are deemed, not only deemed offensive, but you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't really jive with the times now. Maybe this isn't how you would word something in 2020. Maybe we could have said it better. So the country is evolving. To imply that the founding fathers or the constitution are perfect documents, I think is, is the wrong way to go about it. They're not. They were imperfect, that's why they got amended. They were imperfect, that's why people, um, that's why society has changed over the years. It, it's, I think it's gotten, in many ways, it's gotten better, and in some ways, it's, it's not gotten better. But 
I, I don't think that you can discard the principles of freedom and liberty and self-reliance and the importance of those things in a society just because the founding fathers at the time were living lives and people had slaves back then. That's an unfortunate reality of where we were historically at that time, but that doesn't mean that the concept of individual liberty and freedom is any less valuable or important. So that's what I would say to that. Um, in terms of government controlling your body, this is an, a, that's a whole debate about abortion that we, you know, that's very difficult to have in the amount of time we have now. What I would say to you is that people who stand up for the pro-life movement and this is an issue that I struggled with, by the way, personally. I'm very open about that. I've been very open about that on television. Um, because I am a limited government advocate, and I, I do believe that people have a right. There are instances where women have um, medical conditions that arise where they have to be able to, 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 to say, listen, you know, I, I can't. There, there's, there's, you know, life of the mother. There's health of the mother sometimes, serious conditions that they may have that they unfortunately can't carry a baby to term, and they have to be able to make that decision with their doctor, and I can, my, I can wrap my mind around that. What I argue against are things like late-term abortion, where you have, really, there's, it's, it's unnecessary, because any complication that arises at that stage of pregnancy, and believe me, I, I've, I've lived through a pregnancy now where you, your eyes open in a new and different way, but what happens at that stage is a delivery. The baby gets delivered, doesn't get aborted, um, if there's a complication or if the mother's life is at risk. That's just not how it works. Um, and you can talk to doctors and they'll tell you that. Uh, so I have issues with late-term abortion. I have, late, I have issues with politicians who get on air and say, well, if the baby is born alive, we'll see what happens and then we'll decide. No, that's a live baby. That is a, that's a human that was actually born. We're not talking about a fetus anymore, as many call it. We're talking about a baby that came out and was born and now it's your job to sustain them as you would any other person who needed a respirator or was in a hospital. And So that's where I take issue and how I hold that today. But I think what people in the pro-life movement would say and argue against with that is that that's a person inside someone and that person is also guaranteed to rights. So they are stepping in to protect a human that doesn't have a way to protect themselves. That is the argument to be made. Um, that's not the argument I'm making, because I have caveats when it comes to that, because I do feel um, that I have witnessed friends and family members who've gone through early stages of pregnancy where issues have arisen, and it would have endangered them. And I, 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 I know what that looks like, and I know that there needs to be some leniency in that discussion. And obviously, you want to care about the woman, too. And, and she has a place in this whole conversation. Um, so that's what I would say to that. But that is, the, that is the reply that I think you would hear from someone who was unapologetically and exclusively pro-life on all counts to answer. We do have a lot of issues here. There are parents that are now enabling their children. Those children, whether they do or don't have the capability of thinking, how do we change that? And how do we de-energize those people that are in the Bernie camp, so to speak, to be able to think? How do you give that person that incentive? As a parent? As a parent. So, you know, I, had a, I grew up in a house, I was very lucky. I grew up in a house where everyone felt differently about everything. At the time, it was incredibly frustrating to get anything done because everybody had an opinion and everybody had a different way of looking at it. And that goes to, you know, my grandparents were Democrats. Um, my dad is really conservative, like makes Ted Cruz look like a liberal conservative. Um, my mom is kind of more in line with how I see the world. We had friends and family. We had a very diverse group of people, and I mean, you know, racially, gay, straight. I was surrounded by a lot of opinions on a lot of different issues. I think that is key for a child growing up. It was, it was really important for me because I got to hear everything and I got to sit and think about it and I got to step in somebody else's shoes and I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't shocked by anyone's way of life or whether it was someone who, I mean, everything pretty much was on the table for discussion in my house. So I think number one is you talk to your kids and you leave introduce them to a lot of different people with a lot of different, you may not like those views, you may not agree with those views, but it does a service to your child to expose them to those views and have them say, well, hold on a second, that doesn't make sense to me or that does make sense to me. And you know what? You may have a kid that completely disagrees with you, but you'll have a kid that thinks 
So you have to decide what's really important. When it comes to students and when it comes to, you know, I've taught for years, I think you have to create a classroom that feels like a space where they are there to grow and that they are comfortable raising their hand. So um, I had a teacher who's here. I don't want to, um, I don't want to point her out because she may not want to be, but I had a teacher in high school who was really, really good, really, really smart, scary smart almost. Like she it used to scare me, she how smart she was. I'd, I'd come home and tell my parents, she's scary smart. But I felt, I used to raise my hand a lot uh, because I felt like it was welcome. And sometimes I would challenge her and sometimes I would have some crazy question, but I always felt that it was a space that that was what we were there for. So as teachers, I think you need to create that. The other enemy of all of this, I will tell you, is this right here. And I invite you to read my book. It's, it's called Hashtag Do Not Disturb, and it talks about the effect of these phones and this constant technology on young people. There's a rise in ADHD that's coinciding with a rise in these devices. We now have the attention span that's less than that of a goldfish. Uh, that's true, actually. Multiple studies have been done. Social media is wrecking the way we communicate with each other and the way we interact. If you keep your phone in your bedroom at night and it's close to you, even if it's not on, you are distracted. It is causing sleeplessness in people. It's causing anxiety. There are detox clinics popping up around the country for this. I thought about talking about exclusively this today, but because it was the Founding Fathers lecture, but this is my baby and this is my topic because this is the topic that's really gonna, for young people, they, they really need to, this is it, I'm telling you. Read the book, get this as far away from any dinner table, any, any moment that you want to have with your kids where you're actually having a positive exchange of information, this has to go. And I don't care that they want the iPad at three and a half, it's not good. And I was a fan of the TV, don't get me wrong, I watched TV as a kid, television is not this. This is not television. These, these, these apps and these video games, all of this is being engineered by people in Silicon Valley, by the way, who study behavioral science and study behavioral psychology and hire people to figure out how to turn you into a puppet. And they, they, they have decided, um, they've figured out actually that it takes you, all of us, a certain amount of time of clicking something in order to get addicted. And they have actually, you're all, every one of us that's, that's on this phone all day is actually has been programmed essentially by them. And they're sitting and you know, making a ton of money and laughing about it. But who's suffering is your kids who now aren't thinking. And you don't think when you're on this thing. People can't even write. My mom came home a few uh, months ago and was really upset. And she said that she had had a conversation with, uh, she had gone to someone's house and the child could not write in script. And she was really upset about that. And I said, Mom, nobody writes in script anymore. And she was like, but writing, in, writing there was something to that. And you, know, you think of a love letter that you wrote when you were, that's all lost. And that all means something because it's all tied into communication and it's all tied into people forming their own opinions. Think about how many, when you were young, did anybody write in a journal? and handwrite that journal and figure out how they felt about the world. Languages, and it was, mm -hmm. different languages. Right, mm -hmm. so that's all dying. And like I say, the reason I pull personal responsibility into everything is because it's on you, right? So if you don't care about limited government and you don't care about academic freedom, but you do care about this, okay. It's the same underlying value, it's just where you apply it. And it's the same concept of, you know, people were saying, oh, well, government has to come in and regulate our usage of phones. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't need to tell me how to run. If you need to tell me if local or state or federal government needs to step in and tell me when to turn my phone off, man, am I in trouble. Man, am I in trouble. I better just call it a day now. Truly. Anyone else? But they might need to step in and tell you how much of your individual information can be shared with who. That's different. Okay, so that's different. That is... Um, that's what's been going on with Facebook, too, where people feel like their information is being shared. That's different because that is, that's federal government. That is a different conversation about federal regulation of private businesses who operate in social media distribution. That's different. What I'm talking about is what you do at home and how you manage these devices. That's, I think, more related. But yes, that is a good point, and that's a whole other debate. <laughs> Does the government know better? And I mean, we could be here for five days. <laughs> yes. Hi, so you focused a lot of attention on personal accountability, which is definitely very important, and I believe a core value, but in terms of like, regardless of what side of the spectrum you're on, I think it's important to like hold yourself accountable for your decisions, and as that like circles back to healthcare, like 2008 when Obamacare was like first initiated, like yeah, more people had access, but at the end of the day, like 
especially this summer, like I also like worked in customer service and a lot of the individuals that were working in the food service industry, like they really, they couldn't afford it and they chose to like get taxed in return. And on, on the other side of the spectrum, you have a lot of celebrities, you have a lot of big personalities in this world that have a lot of capabilities and a lot of power and have expressed that they feel very passionate about healthcare. And like, in my opinion, regardless of like liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, I think we all agree that like healthcare is important and we agree on the issues, we just have a different way of getting there. But for all the people that have millions of dollars that feel passionate, like why haven't we explored like different alternatives in terms of like private, private institutions or private developments where all these people that feel passionate have the money and the yeah. power and the energy to really pursue that and then give to people that don't have it to supplement any of that extra cost or even, I don't even know if this is possible, but even the concept or the argument, discussion of a publicly traded health fund. Like why hasn't this been discussed? Mm -hmm. Because like, I think a lot of people have the passion and the energy, but we're not really going down that avenue. You mean like Bloomberg who spent like $500 million to run ads and instead could have put that money towards something useful? Yeah. Exactly. Sure. <laughs> and it's not just Bloomberg. L listen, I'd, I'm, I'm an equal opportunity critic of these things. I, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, the amount of money that's spent on campaigning, and it's, it's absurd. I mean, it's truly absurd. Um, so my answer to that will displease some, but maybe others will cheer me on, but it's because a lot of those people, it doesn't affect them affect them. I mean, truly, and I don't care if it's you know somebody who's a, a billionaire or you know has tens and tens of millions of dollars and they're right or left. Do you think they're really going to have to worry about their health care? No, they're going to go to whatever doctor they want. They can afford to pay for it regardless. And even if the system crumbles and it's government run, there's always going to be pockets that open up where you can go to somebody who you know practices. They're going to get on a plane and fly somewhere else and go get taken care of and stay in a beautiful spa for six weeks and come home and the rest of us are going to be like waiting online for a cat skin for seven years. So that's why I think it doesn't happen oftentimes. What you need is people with money who care about this and who want, who care about the integrity of the country and like the personal, who like the individual freedom um, accountability component that you're talking about and want to preserve that, like that's what America is about and don't like the mandates and don't want it to be government run, but are also interested in reform. But you have to, the thing is in order to really be passionate about fixing something, you have to have struggled in it a little bit, I feel, me personally. It's like I have to have lived it a little bit. Like okay, I had a baby, I went to the hospital, I came home and I had thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of bills and I sat there and said, oh my God, what would somebody do? What would I have done 10 years ago? I couldn't pay that, those bills. You know, you come out of, of labor and delivery and you have an issue and you have to go to a physical therapy for two weeks. That's great at $75 a pop that no one takes insurance, but what about someone who's you know, struggling to feed their family? So I, I get it, I really get it. And I'm not a policy wonk here in terms of, I can't sit here and, and, and you know, come up with healthcare policy for you. That's not what I do for a living. I bring people on the show who are and I ask them about it, but I'm uncomfortable with government taking that role on a large scale, in a large scale way because I'm uncomfortable with what that looks like in other countries oftentimes and I'm uncomfortable with relinquishing that control over my health and, and well-being to a bureaucrat. That doesn't mean that I think there's nothing wrong with the system though. I don't know if I need that. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you guys if you don't. Yeah, okay. So. I had this conversation about a year ago with a with a relative, and if I think I know where you're coming from on the on the libertarian side, and I have relatives that are libertarians as well, but the conversation was that government's too big and they're wasteful, and they get involved in things and it, they go awry, and we had this kind of debate about it, and he said we need to have less government. I said okay, now. Do you want less government? I'm just going to name some things, whether, and I think universally we probably agree on it, but do you want less intervention in the environment? Do you, for, because my feeling is that people are basically selfish and they're greedy, so they're going to go for whatever they can get away with. So who's going to control those people? You talk about guns, whole different thing. At what point? Our guns as a government have to step in and say, well, you know, everybody can't own a tank, all right? And the, the next thing is, 
Well, you know, all, all of these things, you know, the stock market, the people that, uh, the, the shady business that happens on Wall Street, there's so many things that the government needs to step into because we as imperfect human beings and many, many people are very greedy, are gonna take advantage of that. And then we have a, a society that we all, as a whole, can't live in. So is the government taking care of those of all of us, but sometimes it doesn't serve it so well because it's just so big. So that's the problem I have with it. I'm, yeah. I'm with you. I think it is wasteful, but yeah. but at what point is it, does it become detrimental to us as a, as a society, as a people? So here, and here's the challenge, right? Is because you know you said we're imperfect human beings, which I wholeheartedly agree with. So government, once again, <coughs> is full of government is full of imperfect human beings, right? So it's basically a whole bunch of imperfect human beings that just happen to work for a government agency, right? They're, they're the same, they're, they're us, except they have that job. These issues, every, everyone will disagree. If I polled everybody in this room, they will disagree about where government is needed and where, oh, well, the environment, no. You know, I heard somebody say, oh, yes, you know. I'm very, very conscious of pollution. Like, that is my baby, that issue. So. What I, what I do feel about this, though, is when I look at government intervention, when you, talk, you talked about a certain issues, you talked about the economy, you talked about businesses, you talked about guns. Guns is, guns is a little bit separate for me, but... It's still motivated. What, what area, mind. though, if you really think about it, I don't find that government does a terribly good job of bettering these situations. Now, what I would say is, one thing is do not underestimate is your purchasing power, right? And what you choose to invest in and what you choose to spend your money in. So I, for example, decided that I cared about clean beauty. I don't know if any of you know what that is, but I am very kind of obsessed in a way with the amount of toxic chemicals we're exposed to in the world every day. And I decided, because I was really sensitive, I was gonna start looking at my skincare and makeup products. And what I found was that it was a hodgepodge of toxic chemicals. And I became really passionate about this. I researched it heavily. And I decided I was gonna put my purchasing power to use and I was going to start buying things that did not look like that. So I took my money away from the max of the world and I put them into a company called Ilia. I care about companies that invest in things that are valuable to me. So I think if on a large scale, if people became more interested in that, businesses would begin to thrive that had those core values that you cared about and ones that didn't would be forced. You see now, can you turn on a channel and look at shampoo, conditioner, or whatnot and not see, do you not see paraben free listed everywhere? Mm -hmm. yes. Those two words, there's a reason for that. Because these companies that I'm talking about started realizing that parabens were found, people who, who had, were developing cancer and whatnot, you were finding these chemicals in their bloodstream in an uncomfortable way. And they started launching this and people became aware and then regular mainstream companies had to keep up with that and now they were like, oh, power been free, power been free, let me put that on, you know. So that's what happens oftentimes is that you underestimate the power of the individual by virtue of their money and, the, and what they choose to spend on and what they choose to talk about. Once again, you are a very powerful, more powerful than you realize, more than the government coming in. Government really doesn't regulate cosmetics in this country very much. I don't know if people know that. But more than the government coming in and doing that, that's the lazy answer. The lazy answer is to have the government come in and do the job that we can and should do for ourselves, which is what I did, which was look up the stuff, say, I'm not putting this in my body and I'm not gonna put my money here. So that is one solution that, that can happen on some level. I think when you talk about guns, it's a little bit different. I think when you talk about, you're right, businesses are concerned with profit, so you always have to balance that. Will businesses be concerned with profit and pollute the heck out of our air? This is why I'm saying there is a role, for me, not everybody who, who says that they're a libertarian conservative will say this. For me, there is a role for government, just not where it is now. I'm not looking for a government takeover of every industry in this country or government management of every industry in this country because I don't think they do it well. And I, don't, I can't think of any, I mean, anybody want to go to the DMV today? No, no one wants to go to the DMV because it's a nightmare. Do you want, you know, no. It's gotten better though. <laughs> I haven't been to the DMV in a few years. I'll have to go there and let you know. Because, it's gotten better. Because people it's gotten have complained about it. Right. Okay. So, and guns is a whole separate conversation. Um, I'm, I'm a passionate, I, I'm not a gun owner, um, which is always funny because I'm such a passionate defender of the Second Amendment, but then people say, and I'm like, yeah, I'm just not into guns. It's just not my thing, you know, but 
I want you to be able to, I want people in rural areas who have, takes them, they pick up the phone to call the police and it takes a half hour for someone to get to them. I need them to be able to protect themselves and their families. So I'm not gonna have some government. Remember how this country was founded? Right? On muskets? <laughs> you mean muskets? <laughs> Well, we're in a different, a little bit of a different world here, but those people, I think they would have a really, there's a reason the Second Amendment was written in there. It's a really big reason it was written in there, okay? So you gotta keep that in mind. But for your safety, for me, it's always, I think of the single mom, or I think of the single dad, or I think of a teenager, you know, uh, not a teenager, but a 20-something home alone, and it, it's scary. I think of members of our, it just, the whole thing scares me on guns, it's a little bit different. But like I said, government intervention, but not government control. And there's a balance there that we're all gonna argue about till kingdom come. Um, but don't forget the power that you have, and you have, and you have, and you have, to dictate what thrives and what dies by virtue of the money you spend. It's enormous. All these people want to do is make money. They all exist for profit. You pull your money, they're done. Enough people pull their money, they're done. But you have to care. You can't just walk into Sephora and pick everything up off the shelves. You have to say, oh, guess what? I'm not going to buy that because that has parabens, and I know that that's bad for me, so I'm going to buy this one over here that doesn't have parabens, and they're going to make money, and they're not. I'm putting it on cosmetics because I'm obsessed with that. It's just my issue of the moment. Could be anything. Deodorant. Anything. Everybody uses deodorant. Things, things like that that are more relatable to everyone. But you know, whatever it may be, that, that conversation can, can happen. We have time for one more question. Do you think he has had his hand for a while? <laughs> I just want to get him back to your business. Uh, is the media becoming irrelevant? I mean, where do you see it all going? If people can go directly to the source to get the information, why do we need all this analysis? That's a great question. I hope it's not getting irrelevant. I need a job. But, <laughs> um, you know, I think that we still live in a world, and now we have the digital media that's popped up too, where people go online um, for a lot of their news. I don't know that a lot of people read the newspaper anymore. I don't. I go online, I get all my news online. Um, I think that people still like to hear, I think it has, be, media, media in large part has become entertainment and I think we need to acknowledge and accept that, right? You listen to me on a Saturday morning, are, people know Pete, Hexeth? Yes, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. All right, so Pete and I are always like, I'm always like, Pete, you know, Pete's very strong Trump supporter, MAGA, you know, I'm a conservative, but you know, some issues with Trump here and there, we're always going, it's entertaining, right? To, to watch us kind of go at it and, um, I think there's an entertainment value there where people, instead of watching a sitcom or whatever, they watch us argue around a table about politics because these are the issues people are talking about in their homes. I think there's going to be a space for that for a long time to come because these are the discussions people are having around their dinner tables and they like to be able to turn the television on and see that same discussion paralleled through the television at them. In terms of information, I don't know how long it's going to be that people are gonna tune into the news for their information. I think they'll read an article, they'll scroll, you know, they'll, they'll get little tidbits here and there, unless there is a catastrophic event that happens like a tornado or a school shooting or something where everyone goes to the TV because you're, you're tuned in for updates minute to minute. But I do think there is some value in entertainment that has happened. It's become, truly, I mean, I watch other networks sometimes for, for amusement to see, you know, the, the bickering that I don't get to see and, in my own studio, and God knows I, t I partake in it. Anybody who knows my work, um, I mean, I w what worked on The View was all that, you know? So it's, it's fun to watch, and I think there's a space for that in people's homes that they enjoy. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.